Hi everybody. This is the second of two videos about how I've turned this 2004 Honda minivan into a small camper. If you haven't seen the first video, I recommend you take a quick look at that. It's only 10 minutes and it gives a good overview of the whole project and how all the parts fit together. I'll put a link in the description. It'll give you a good backgrounder because I'm going to try not to repeat anything I said in the first video. I'd like to talk about a few of the parts in a little more detail, specifically the convertible couch bed that I made and also the water system. One of the comments I got after the first video was questioning whether or not it was a good idea to use wood in a minivan build because it might be too heavy. I don't think that's really a concern because the seats that I took out were about 200 pounds and all of the parts that I built and installed totaled about 300 pounds. So I'm only up about 100 pounds, which is really nothing for a vehicle like this. I found no difference in handling, no difference in braking, and no difference in gas mileage. So let's take another look inside. I want to talk about a few things that I changed and a few details about how I built the bed and how I plumbed up the water system. As a reminder, the way the bed operates is from the couch mode that it's currently in, the way to convert it to a bed is you simply flip up on this, pull forward, and then there are four support legs underneath that need to be extended. One, two, three, four, and then just continue sliding forward, and then you have a twin size bed. To convert it back into the couch mode, it's just as easy, it's the process just in reverse. You pull up on this just a little bit, slide back, and then these legs fold under. Push back. That's it. To get a better look at how I built this and how the parts go together, I'm going to take the bed frame and platform out so we can look at it in a little more detail. So these panels, the front, second, and third panel are each 18 and a half by 36. Now this rear part from here to here, this is also 18 and a half, but it's split into two. This one's four and a half, and this one is about 14. Okay, so all four of these sections, and I'm counting this as one segment, are each the same size, and they're 18 and a half. The reason for that is 18 and a half times four is 74, and that is the length of the mattress after it was cut into four sections and upholstered. Now, you're gonna need four piano hinges, one, two, there's one under here, three, and four. So this one flips up like this, that's why you need two there. This, this short panel is the only panel that's actually screwed to the frame support. So that's why this panel can flip up, these two panels can tilt up, and this front panel can slide. This is three quarter inch maple ply. I chose maple because it has a really smooth finish and with a little bit of sanding and a couple layers of poly you get a super smooth uh, splinter free surface that's also really pretty to look at if you get a nice piece although one thing I would say is that maple is heavier than pine so if you choose pine it'll be a little bit lighter and that might be a benefit the underside really only has one structural feature aside from these legs, and this is this stopper. And the stopper prevents the front panel from sliding forward when, it, when it's in couch mode. Essentially, it locks the couch into place. So the stopper is right behind this frame piece, and then this cannot move forward. So there are four legs. And the reason for this is to support this panel when it's pulled out into bed mode. And the reason I had to do that is because originally I had built the frame with these, with these side frame pieces extending all the way forward to su support the front panel when it was extended. But this really blocked my access from the side door of the van, so I literally just chopped those off and I installed these legs instead, and these really work great. The frame is all regular two by four pine construction. The leg and the side rail are glued at this face and uh, reinforced with a, some T hardware. 
Same thing here and on the other side. These two angle braces, this is where that four or five inch uh, wide section, this is where it gets bolted to the frame. So the dimensions on this frame are, it's 54 inches from the rear to the front. The legs, this leg is six inches, this leg is four and a half. Hmm, why are they different? Well, it's because when the van is parked on level ground, the floor of the van is not level. The part closest to the driver's seat is actually lower than the rear. So to make the bed level, when the van's parked on level ground, these legs have to be different lengths. Now that's gonna vary for every different van model. The width is right around 30 inches. Now the platform, as you remember, was 36 inches. The reason the frame is so much narrower than the platform is because on both sides of the frame, there has to be room for the flip down legs to be accommodated. If you think you might actually wanna build a folding bed platform like this, I highly recommend you also check out the channel, Eric Enjoys Earth. His video on the folding bed, his design is what I use to base this design on. I did make a lot of changes to this because my van configuration is a little different. However, his video was very helpful and I recommend you do that if you're actually gonna go ahead and build one of these designs. So my kitchen setup consists of the fridge, this soft cooler, which serves as my, as my pantry, and a wastebasket. This is a 35 liter Bouge RV compressor fridge. Now the one I showed in my last video was a Coolatron thermoelectric. That one took 55 watts constant power. This is a compressor, so it's only on part of the time. It runs about 20 watts. This is a huge upgrade and it'll also make ice. Over here in the sink area, paper towel roll, filtered water dispenser, and of course, one of the things I like best about this build is the sink. It's so convenient to have running water available inside the van and also accessible from the outside. If I open that door, then it's a basically a standing height sink. So let's take a look around the other side and see how I have that system plumbed. So the water system consists of a few parts. This is the pump, which draws water from this two and a half gallon feed jug, pumps water up to the faucet and drains to a gray water collector. Now this pump is powered by this 12 volt battery pack. So these are the electrical components of my water pump system. It's the pump, eight AA batteries. AA batteries are 1.5 volts each. So when eight of them are connected in series, that makes 12 volts. And then I have a switch in line between them so that I can turn the water on and off from the countertop switch. The black line of the pump is connected to the black line of the battery box. That's shown here. And then the red line from each of the pump and the battery box are connected to each of two wires from just a regular extension cord, which I have cut down. Now the purpose of putting the extension cord in place is so that I can remove this whole electrical system from the van when the system is not in use and when I'm con converting the van to just have seats in it. So between the pump and the battery on the red line is this switch. Now the switch is wired to the other end of this extension cord, the female end of this extension cord, and the two wires of the female end are connected to each of these two posts. So when the switch is in the off position, of course the pump turns off, and when it's on, the pump is on. One thing about this pump is that it's not self-priming. The one thing I might do if I had it to do over again is I might look a little further and choose a self-priming pump, but I chose this one because it was specifically rated for drinking water use. The priming procedure only takes a minute or so and I've not found it to be much trouble. So when I need to start a new jug, this is how I do it. Remove the gray water jug. If you're replacing a jug that has gone empty, there will be air in the line. It's only designed to pump water. So if you have air, you have to get that out. 
but that's actually really simple to do. All you need to do is open the valve, fill water into the tube, and then you want to get the water so it's just at the tip of the tube outlet and you close the valve. Once you close the valve, the water level here at the end of the tube won't change. So you have to get the water at the very end of the tube and make sure that there's no air inside the line. Okay, and then you just put a little kink in the tube and insert it into the full bucket. There are no bubbles in the line, the pump is primed and it's ready to go. Slide this back into place. Put the drain jug back in. That's it. This might seem a little cumbersome, but I've done this many times, and when I need to change out a jug, it's less than 60 seconds. So it, once you get the hang of it, it's very easy. Let's test the sink. And there we go. We've got another two and a half gallons of running water. So you're probably wondering how long will the battery pack last before you have to change it for this little water pump. So you can do a calculation based on eight AA batteries powering a pump like this, which I think it was five watts. Um, and it turns out that even if you assume only 50% of the theoretical capacity of these batteries can be used, that still results in a runtime of about 20 hours. I use about one jug per day, so that's two and a half gallons. This pump moves 1.4 liters per minute, so a gallon is about four liters, so that's 10 liters, 1.4 liters per minute, so that's about, uh, what, seven? I'd run it for about seven minutes, seven minutes a day, so to get to one hour of usage, it would be about eight days, and if I get 20 hours of usage out of a battery pack, that's 20 times eight, turns out to be like 160 days of use, which is way more than I would use it in a whole year. So I probably won't have to change these batteries more than about once a year under normal use. One other interesting bit of information about this pump is that the product literature claims it'll last 20,000 hours before it fails. Now I use the pump less than 10 minutes a day, but even if I used it for a full hour a day, how long would this pump last? Well, at one hour a day, It'll last 20,000 hours, so that's 20,000 days, 365 days a year. So that turns out to be more than 50 years. I don't think I'll ever have to replace this pump. This is my basic kitchen supplies, which is just uh, two bowls, a plate, two cups, a lighter, critical infrastructure right here, coffee filter, and in here is a camp stove. Now this is this is a super compact backpacking stove. It's the fuel, the stove, a pot, all in this one small container. I find that just a single backpacking stove is really plenty for my use. When I travel, I, I'm not really intending to live in this van for months at a time. This is really a travel uh, adventure camping vehicle. So I don't wanna spend a lot of time cooking. Underneath the main couch seat, I have storage for more kitchen equipment, some um, pots and pans, some more cups, some Tupperware, plenty of room for spices and other things. I, I don't even fill this up usually. And in the sink cabinet, I still have an unused section of storage space down here. I try to be as simple as I can when I travel because on a couple of early trips, I packed a lot of stuff that I never used and it was just in my way. And I find that I don't miss the stuff that I haven't brought. I really like the freedom and ease of use of not having a lot of stuff that I have to sort through to get to something I want. So for me, simple works better. Moving along to my shelf storage system, I really like the open shelf concept because I didn't want to mess with cabinet doors, both from the aspect of simpler construction and ease of use. Most of my daily use clothes fit in these four packing cubes uh, up here some toiletries, camera bag, a few books. Over here, I have my battery pack strapped in. And in this bottom section, I have all my bedding, pillows, blankets, sleeping bag, whatever the season might require. One thing that was a slight problem when I was camping is I discovered that even if it's cool at night, 
if it's hot during the day, the van absorbs a lot of heat, and until quite late into the night, there's heat being released from the van. So the inside of the van, even with the windows open, can be pretty warm. I do have a USB fan, which I showed you in the last video, but that doesn't really provide any cross ventilation. And I thought about, you know, really going wild and crazy and tearing a hole in the, in the ceiling and putting in a max air fan, but that seemed like overkill. And there's a lot of, there's, there's duct work, electrical work, and structural panels in the roof of this van that I just didn't want to mess with. So the only other option was the tilt out rear windows in the back. So what I came up with was I mounted a USB computer fan in one of the Coroplast window coverings of the tilt out window. So back behind the battery pack, mounted in the Coroplast is this computer fan. It runs off USB, 800 RPMs. So this is what it looks like from the outside. Now, of course, it's a bit obstructed because the tilt out window only opens a little bit, but I can still feel a pretty good flow of air coming out through here. So with the fan that I normally mount on the grab rail of the passenger window and with this outlet fan that I've mounted in this back window, I do get a cross ventilation airflow. I haven't actually tested the tilt out fan in a camping situation, but at least it will be some kind of improvement. Didn't cost very much and it was easy to put in, so what the heck, why not? Taking a look around the back, just want to show you quickly what I have under here. And I have two additional two and a half gallon water jugs, plenty of room for other shoes, clothing, camping supplies, and so on. Under here, some more van supplies. I have tool kit, cables, this is a battery jump pack in case I need to jump my battery to start it. Under here I have a 12 volt air pump for a flat tire and a flat tire puncture repair kit, an immersion shower which runs off USB, and a few other odds and ends. So that's a wrap. I hope this video was able to maybe answer a few questions you might have had or given you a few ideas for your own project. So until next time, take care and maybe I'll see you down the road.